Please, first on the floor is Fabian Hecker. Give him hands, please. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, we've just shared it a little bit. We meet up and then uh, across the globe, I would even say. Huh? I mean, we, we know each other also a little bit longer than two days. Um, so, Morris, we have get a little bit gray during the past uh, five years of experience we have got in the industry. He's more than 21 years now at Sahad in Architects. So he's really a reputed architect in that area. He has a, a German diploma engineer degree in architecture, which is re really rare in Salem. He studied in Aachen, but came to London also to finish the landscaping architecture studies here in London. Fabian, the floor is yours, 15 minutes, more or less sharp, okay? Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thank you, Werner. Thank you for inviting, uh, inviting me uh, to, to the opening of the showroom and, uh, and your presence here in London. Um, I, as you mentioned, 15 minutes. I'll do my very best to stay within, uh, within uh, the slot. There we go. Room with a view is the, the topic for today. Um, I will focus on transparency. It's not very exciting when you talk about glass. It's obviously the, the essence of it. But that's one of the reasons why I want to talk about that um, a little bit. So when you think about transparency in glass, obviously you associate it with the window. The window is one of the archetypes of architecture. It sits in a wall uh, and it's that part of the wall, if you like, that is not opaque, but is open and uh, allows a view out and allows uh, light to come into the room. Um, and glass, obviously, when it, uh, when it was invented, uh, maintained that function of the window, but it also allowed to keep the elements out. Uh, very basic. Um, that concept was obviously refined over the years uh, when it came to modernism and the advance of technology. Um, glass and the window uh, became something you try to you try to increase the glass, you try to dissolve the wall um, very much. And this project by Mies van der Rohe uh, in uh, the uh, Tugendhat House is called. You can see the the, the back elevation here. Um, the view out of out of the main room and you may be able to see that not only are they uh, large window panes but these window panes were actually designed to be lowered so when the weather is nice enough you can actually make these windows disappear and the glass literally disappears so transparency becomes actual openness very radical approach um, and the next step in that evolution of dissolving the wall and of the for glass to take over is obviously the curtain wall. There's a project from the 1950s, sorry, 1970s, so Norman Foster, where the wall is finally completely dissolved and replaced um, by glass. And now the reason why I want to talk about transparency, that's a, it's an essay that was written in the 1960s uh, by uh, two American or British American scholars and architects, Colin Rowe and Robert Slutsky, and they, they looked at transparency uh, from a slightly different angle. So they say there's two ways, or two, transparency can be two different things. It might be the inherent quality of, of, of a substance such as glass or a curtain wall, or it may be something more abstract like an organizational quality. And they call these different approaches um, the literal and the phenomenal uh, transparency. And that's something I found very interesting as a tool for us, because we're obviously designing and we're designing holistically, uh, taking any kind of project from the very beginning to the detail. So along the way, we, yes, we're dealing with glass uh, as a material, but we start this process much, much earlier. And um, that is a, a useful concept we find. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, what does that mean? And what's the difference maybe? Um, so also in spatial terms, uh, the glass, the idea of glass that we just discussed or that I tried to explain what we normally would associate with glass and transparency in a way can be related to a spatial concept um, which is maybe represented by, by this drawing. The ideal city, it's a, it's a Renaissance painting. It's obviously dominated by a linear perspective. Uh, it represents a space that is um, very much controlled. It's controlled and, and ordered, uh, and it's controlled by the viewer. So the focus, although one is not in the picture, the focus is the viewer, is the person, the subject. Um, it, is, uh, it is the um, enlightened subject of the Renaissance uh, and, and, and the, the modern times. Um, you see there's a layering, uh, there's a depth in that space. You kind of can anticipate what is behind each of the elements. It's very much a focused and ordered and very static space in many ways. 
static and controlled, as I said, from the person that this uh, painting is focusing from. Um, and if you then look at the different concept of space, which might be behind this term of phenomenal space, it's something that is may maybe more like a cubist painting where there isn't a clear perspective. The depth that we had, this illusion of depth, uh, has disappeared. Instead, there's a layering of very different angles. You know, it's a building or a painting that is almost deconstructed and reconstructed through different angles, looking at the same object, um, but all superimposed uh, in, in, in this painting. So something that is more multidimensional, you have uh, very different angles. You have an aspect of temporality that's all of a sudden included because you can imagine you're walking around the object and you're capturing different, different views of the object in the same plane. Uh, at the same time, as I said, it's a flat space. It's non-hierarchical uh, in my view. Um, it's multidimensional. We said that it's multi-angular. Um, and it is, it is somewhat dynamic because it incorporates these different, um, these different perspectives. And that is interesting um, as a concept, as I say, because all of a sudden it becomes something that is maybe less confined, that is less clear, that is much, much more open um, as a concept. And there's something, it's a painting by uh, Le Corbusier uh, from 1930, um, which is much more geometric, much, much calmer, but which maybe shows a little bit the concept behind the way this space and this painting is organized, which is, as I said, is a plane, is flat. There is not even the attempt to try to uh, create a depth, but it's very different objects which are um, superimposed, overlaid of each other. They are, have adjacencies, but there isn't really a very clear relationship defined between them. They seem to be floating on top of each other, um, but the composition as such is very open. So these elements that you see, these abstract geometric elements, which some of them represent objects, others maybe not. But even if they do represent something, you can see how they could be, again, deconstructed. They can, they can start to interrelate in ways which are not preconceived, maybe. So something, depending on how you look at it, you maybe associate one element with another. Next time you associate two different elements and they mean something different. So it's, it's an open field um, that very much uh, has a dynamic um, a legibility maybe built in, but also as a, it's almost a map that you can use and create something new out of. And as I said, the, that's very much, it's very much achieved by superimposing these very different elements onto one plane. Um, and the effect is not too dissimilar um, to this figure to the, on the right. You can see figure ground. So it's two things in one, in one image, if you like. So it's either two faces or it's a vase, depending on what you look. And what is foreground, what is background, isn't really clear. And it kind of oscillates between these two things, depending on how you look at it. And that, that's an interesting concept. On the, on the other side, I've put the uh, Nolly map of Rome from, 17, uh, from the 1780s. So Nolly mapped Rome, Baroque Rome at the time. And that's a traditional way of doing it. Black is the building, white is the streets. But what he did is he introduced all public spaces into that map. So you see churches, courtyards and everything. And all of a sudden, it's not so clear anymore which is which. You know, what is a building? From what point on are you in a building? And from what point on are you still in the city, in the public space? So you could argue that it is maybe un, it's unwanted, but it has a very similar effect. And finally, uh, Zaha did uh, one of the first projects or early projects from the late 1980s uh, in Berlin, uh, the Victoria area in Kudam. You can see some similarities. Again, it's a field. It is something that um, incorporates very many different um, perspectives of the same project, kind of seamlessly in this big field. You, know, you have it from different vantage points. Um, you can, but you can also sense how the project is actually developed out of this, you know, which to an extent represents the, the urban fabric um, and, and is the, is, it was the, 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 or, the origin of, of, of the development of that project, of its tectonics and everything. And it's, but it's, it's one big field, uh, again, um, where things seem to be pop, popping up 
different perspectives uh, are, are all seamlessly integrated. That maybe just briefly to try and explain different uh, concepts um, of, of transparency based, based on this distinction. Now, obviously, when it comes to construction on reality, you never have it one way or the other. It's always a mix of the two things. I'm going to show two projects briefly, and I hope that here and there maybe some of the aspects that I just uh, tried to explain pop up and, and, and resonate. So this is the Opus uh, project, a mixed-use project in, in Dubai, which we completed a few years ago. Um, it's in Business Bay uh, in Dubai. If you know Dubai, it's basically a city made out of small cities. Business Bay is one of them uh, next to the Birch. Um, when we started the project in 2006, there wasn't anything uh, but what you see there. But there was a master plan, a very simple master plan. You can see three building types. Uh, we had a yellow type, type A, um, and that was the master plan was basically a podium for parking and two towers on top. Um, this is roughly how it looked 2014 or so. You can see it's a, it's a big visual mess despite the simplicity of uh, the master plan. And the opus, you can see it. See up there, you see it is slightly different from all the other buildings, although they're all trying to be different desperately. So how did we achieve that? It was an interpretation of the master plan and some tweaking of the rules, let's say. So on the right-hand side, you see the base idea, podium to towers. Then we said, well, what if you connect the two towers and we create a cube? Um, and then a very important thing was, what if we uh, take the parking, move it away from the ground and put it underground, liberating the ground floor. And then finally, that allows us to express the ground floor uh, in a very particular way. Um, this was the original concept program. It was ma mainly an office building with some retail on the, on the ground floors and the parking below ground. During the construction process, that changed. It had to do with the financial crash of 2008. The business model changed, and whilst there were restarted construction, we were asked to redesign the building on the inside without changing anything on the outside. So we introduced a hotel and service departments, uh, some food and beverage, a nightclub. So all that was, was happening as we were constructing superstructure. As I said before, the envelope did not change. That concept uh, was fixed, and it was from the start, it was the idea of this crystalline uh, sculptural cube. And going back in history a little bit, uh, these are two early designs of Mise en skyscrapers. They're often quoted as the first full glass skyscrapers, ideas never, never built. Um, and as such, uh, are they relevant? But what is interesting, I think, is not so much that it is a full glass envelope, but the fact that the focus he put on it is, is not so much the glass and it's the transparent aspect alone that glass has. And, the idea of modernism, but the fact that they are very irregular floor plans, as you can see in the next slide, which is very awkward, you would think. Um, but the reason behind it is that he wanted to create buildings which are not only transparent, but they play with the reflection. It's becoming there's something that is sparkling, uh, something that is dynamic in its appearance, and that's very much influenced by German expressionism at the time. Uh, where glass and, and that image was, was, was very, um, very important. So this is something that I think we also have in this building. Um, the cube is defined by the master plan, not much, much we can do about it, but by, by cutting this irregular hole in the middle, we are creating surfaces which have some similarity and definitely a similar effect to what Mies uh, conceived uh, in the 1920s. Um, and so this hole that is cut in, uh, we then decided to also differentiate it with a different color of glass um, to make that contrast even stronger. So that is a dark blue. You can see that here in detail. Uh, and the fact this has on some of the spaces on the inside, uh, some seemingly random intersections. The other thing that we did is the outer facade, which is roughly, which is very regular. It's a clear glass. Um, we decided to add another layer onto it, uh, li literally a frit pattern, um, which wraps around the entire uh, around the entire facade. 
that was then translated into a series of, of patterns uh, and elements, facade elements, um, and rationalized to create this seemingly random uh, appearance with, uh, with a limited uh, amount of um, uh, facade elements, panels. And we decided to go for a mirror frit, and that obviously has a very, very interesting effect. You can see that on the left-hand side, two of our colleagues there um, taking a, a photo of the sample and creating this, uh, this really almost surreal effect of, of, of mirroring, of transparency, and, and a bit of, of both happening at the same time, if you, if you look here, for example. No? So kind of going back to this idea uh, of this fluctuating um, appearance. Yeah, this is just a, a detail um, and how that was applied to the to the building. I'm just going to take you on a little walk around the building from different perspectives and you can see uh, how it changes, uh, how the effect um, is slightly different yet consistent from all from all sides. So you can hear the building almost disappears in the sky. The skyline seems to continue through the building. Um, this is an overlay of all the conditions we just talked about. So we have reflection, we have transparency, a reflection of the uh, surrounding, but also reflection just purely of the sun of light. Some uncontrolled reflections here on the, in the hole in the middle. The other side of the building. Yeah, and um, yeah, so that, that gives you a little bit of an idea um, how we, although we work with glass very much and it's, it is about transparency and it is about reflection, um, but we hope to have introduced something that is not just a mute tower, but something that is animated, that is lively um, and that interacts very much uh, with its surrounding and that changes appearance, not only from the angle, but also depending on the day, the light condition. The next project uh, is also in the region National Build Heritage Center in Diria in Saudi Arabia. It's a project we developed uh, together with uh, Damien Ekasleo Callaghan, responsible for the facade. And this is very different in the sense, I'll come to that later. So Diria, just a, a brief uh, history, said as National Build Heritage Center. It's very much uh, located in the center of Saudi. It's the uh, it's the, the essence or the core or uh, the origin of the, the Saudi state uh, of the current of the current state. So the uh, the Saud family um, originated from there. They liberated the country from there. So it is an important uh, important uh, place in, in in Saudi. It is just outside Riyadh in the so-called Wadi Hanifa, and it was the capital of the first Saudi state. Um, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site by now. Um, you can see the, the, the UNESCO bit here uh, in the front. Um, and we were approached, we won a competition actually to build the National Build Heritage Center that was to document what's going on there, but obviously with the ambition to do that for the, all, of, um, all of Saudi. Um, this is the, the works underway uh, to restore. It's all compacted earth. Um, so. It's remarkable how much was actually left, um, given that it was abandoned for the longest time. But that's obviously a clue that we took for the building. Another clue is the context, uh, the main elements here. We obviously have the, the dunes, the, the, the desert, the oasis, and then what is this explained, the direct context of this rammed earth uh, traditional construction, which we tried to wrap into a building. Um, it's a heritage building. We've had many conversations with the locals and say, well, it doesn't look like one. Um, and the concept that we had and it was ultimately also successful in the competition is not so much trying to, to mimic a mimicry of what is there, um, but to hopefully interpret it in a contemporary way, but retaining some of the qualities that the traditional construction has. So um, these very uh, massive uh, walls that they have, obviously they have to do with, deal with the heat, small openings uh, is something that we took as a clue, but that's not something that you can build a, a modern building out of. So we try to replicate that effect, but using different materials, using a metal facade, 
um, working with um, working with perforation. So again, trying to play with the effect of something from a certain distance, an angle looks solid, and then if you approach from a different angle, it'll come closer, maybe all of a sudden it starts to become porous. Um, yeah, so same concept. And you can see that here a little bit, we have the actual uh, um, thermal envelope, which is fully glazed, but a screen around it, um, which creates that effect, which obviously helps with shading and controlling uh, the temperatures, just the detail around these openings. And how we are creating this uh, perforation, something we worked a long time with uh, Eckersley, what is the best concept? So we ended up with this twisted, what we call the twisted fin, which is a diamond, diamond shaped uh, profile you can see. And very cleverly, we managed to hide the substructure in between and we rotated around that bar. Um, the other thing we very much liked uh, or were interested in is this concept of the traditional Islamic city. Um, it is obviously a very dense city, and it's the, a typology made out of uh, courtyard houses. And what is interesting about it is that, again, we've seen a little bit with the Nolly map before, the inside and the outside is somewhat not clear where you are. Now, you're, you're, you're outside, this looks like a city block, so here this might be a street, and you enter the block, but then are you really inside the block, or is it still a street? Um, and then you enter a courtyard, and then, yes, you enter a courtyard. Are you in the building, or is it still part of a previous space? So you're constantly in a condition where you don't really know if you're outside or inside of something. And that's something that we also thought is an interesting concept we try to, we try to replicate to an extent. So we have these two volumes inside. I should say that space on the ground floor is an exhibition. So we, we took these two, we call them pebbles, for lack of a better word, but these two elements around which we have this, this snaking exhibition space and we organize the entire, entire ground floor through it. But this is, yet, is a solid that's inside this building. Um, so you can see it here a little bit, how they are organized uh, and the exhibition flows around it. But the concept very much was that you have that effect. You enter a building and then you're in this kind of in-between space. You see something else, something else solid, and you maybe find yourself in that condition between two different objects. Um, just briefly in terms of Materiality, um, something that we took the clue from the more traditional structures, obviously, and applied it. Um, this tries to show a little bit. Now, you, you, you approach the building from the outside, uh, you have this effect from solid versus porous, and you enter, and all of a sudden, you see another solid object, or two solid objects inside, and then you can enter them again. Yes, so just take you on a tour as well from the outside, then you are in this kind of in-between space. You've gone through the screen of the facade and, and you're seeing these strange objects inside. You can walk in them. They are somewhat partially closed, partially open. Um, you know, the change of material to also play with the inside and outside to make that clear. The view back, the view up, because this is organized uh, across two levels and the view at the top. I think I leave it here because I'm, I'm otherwise overrunning and working. Thank you very much. Thank you for your impressive presentation. Thanks a lot. I mean, of course, I cannot leave you from stage without a question or two or three. Maybe the audience also. Uh, straight away. I mean, it's all about the view. We've seen that the view could be transparent, non-transparent, inside, outside. But what is more important? Is it the architect's view or the occupant's view? This was not questions beforehand, so let him time to think it over. No, I mean, obviously, we, when we design, we design with the occupant or the user uh, in mind. I mean, architecture, at the end of the day, is a social, uh, is a social art, if you want to call it like that. Um, uh, and and this, is all, this is what it must be all about. Um, uh, obviously, architects have particular um, passions and things they like to pursue and do. And we're not pretending to be not the author of the building. I mean, as an artist, that would be very difficult to do, uh, to mm. argue that and win that argument. Um, but it is finding a balance between the two. Yes. Lovely. Any more questions from the audience straight away or after a period? Uh, Minimize the heat from outside. 
in this last project. So um, the the uh, this shading screen that we put around the um, the actual thermal envelope is very much you know the angles of of of, of these um, of these twisted parts of the fins are very much twisted in such a way that they follow the sun path. So we're optimizing the shading function of that envelope. But does it move as the sun itself? It doesn't move, no, but it, you know, it, it follows the sun path and basically is oriented in such a way that, that it optimizes the, the shading function. It's a trade-off, you know, you need to let daylight in, but you want to keep the sun out and, um, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Fabian. Okay. Much more time later on, a little bit to discuss with Fabian on that one.